Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode four of the Wisdom Keeper podcast, where I am delighted to introduce you to Dr. Ian Baker, a Tibetan scholar, yogi, explorer par excellence, and author with more than 40 years experience studying and teaching Tibetan Buddhism. Ian is an international fellow of the Explorers Club. He was honored by the National Geographic Society as one of six explorers for the millennium for his ethnographic and geographic field research in Tibet's Sangpo Gorge, where he and his team discovered a waterfall that had been the source of myth and geographic speculation for more than a century. So this man is certainly an explorer of realms, mysterious and mystical, both outward and inwards. And so on this podcast, we'll be discussing what is called the Outer Inner and Secret Pilgrimage with someone who knows it in an intimate and truly authentic way. Ian is the author of several critically acclaimed books on Himalayan and Tibetan culture, environment, art, and medicine, including The Heart of the World, A Journey to the Last Secret Place. He's also the author of The Tibetan Art of Healing and The Dalai Lama's Secret Temple, as well as his latest book, Tibetan Yoga's Secrets from the Source. Ian has also written extensively for the National Geographic magazine and has contributed to academic journals in the fields of Tibetan yoga and Vajrayana Buddhism. Like myself, Ian is also a keen and avid pilgrimage leader where he leads groups to sacred sites in India, Tibet, and Bhutan. Together, Ian and I, in this podcast, retrace his steps on his epic Campbellian hero's journey from his childhood expeditions in mountaineering to his first pilgrimage to Nepal at 19, where he met some of the most celebrated Tibetan masters of the last century. And to his also, we also get this very intimate uh, perspective on his first experience of awakening or Kensho during a meditative retreat in his college years and also the follow-up. I talked about it to him about the period of integration following such an unbelievable life-changing experience. And then we go from there into his pioneering efforts to practice the intensive Tibetan yogas under the advice of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in a secret cave during solitary meditative retreat where he confronts his own mind, starts to hear the voices of the Dakinis. I'm sure you'll join me in really appreciating this insider's perspective of some of the netherworlds that can be had or, or journeyed to in deep meditative retreat. In, in essence, I feel like the conversation throughout was very much carding to the heart of Dzogchen, the nature of mind, and you can kind of experience this sort of dance between illusion or self-imposed limitation and sort of the boundless luminosity that is our own true nature. So I'm very, very, very glad and fortunate for Ian. First, I have a tremendous respect for his accumulation of academic knowledge, but also he's one of these people that has also sat in deep and extensive retreat, has confronted the demons of his own mind, but also one that has tapped the nectar and the bliss of his own nature. And so there's a very interesting undercurrent through our conversation about, in a way, how he flips the Four Noble Truths so that basically suffering is optional. Our basic nature is blissful and open. And so if you turn the pilgrimage on its head and start from the, store, uh, start from the source or start from the, the, the destination, as tantric Buddhism really advises, if you start at the ground or you start at the result, you are already awake. You are already part of utterly inseparable from reality. Uh, you are already part of the vast, blissful, luminous openness. And every time we uh, deviate and, and, and get caught in an eddy of the delusion, uh, we have another opportunity to return home. And so, you know, that's a wonderful Tibetan spin on the pilgrimage of the heart and the journey of uh, awakening. Uh, starting from the, the result and, and always trying to cultivate familiarity with that base. Um, this, this is a very, you know, was a very wonderful and rich conversation, which I think you're going to enjoy. 
we really get to see some of the early interest in mountaineering that Ian uh, had a natural proclivity to. And this, I think, is very wonderful because it showed in his early biography how, you know, he was looking to push the limits of his own mind very early on and how those early childhood experiences of what he calls going, hor or going vertical, you know, trying to master the mountain and the challenges and the self-imposed limitations and the fears of mountaineering, how those really set him up for his inner expeditions confronting the same self-imposed fears of his mind. I think this is really truly wonderful for all of us because in a way it shows how the human spirit of, of, of adventure is there in all of us very early on. Some of these seemingly mundane kinds of childhood experiences get parlayed and folded back in later in life to be extraordinarily symbolic and significant. I share with Ian Baker a very common origin story to our love, fascination, commitment, and loyalty to the Tibetan path. Both of us in our college years went abroad during our junior year, which, you know, at least on the East Coast is a very common opportunity in liberal arts colleges to have a junior year abroad experience. Most people head off to London or Florence to study art or economics. In Ian's and my case, we had this glorious opportunity that was sort of called from the depths of the soul to go to the netherworlds. In my case, India, straight to the heart of the um, of, of Buddhism, to the uh, Bodhgaya site of Buddha's enlightenment. And in Ian's case, he discusses his pilgrimage to Nepal, to the Kathmandu Valley. And in at least, you know, where the differences are is that Ian was a generation before me. And we can call this a sort of, we can have an idealized view of that sort of er, those early explorers who got to really have the uncorrupted and unblemished natural experience and exposure to the to the Tibetan lamas who were really, really accessible at that time. I mean, he had, you know, direct uh, tutelage with some of the most celebrated Tibetan masters one could ever have hoped for of the last century. And that, those, 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 those encounters really shape Ian's mind. They shape his devotion. They shape his uh, his spirit and his vision for the future. And really, he becomes, an, in, a, in a way, a custodian for the lineage, one of these first pioneering Westerners, like Lama Glenn Mullen, like a Bob Thurman. I would put Ian Baker up in that category. So in that way, we owe a tremendous debt to Ian Baker. as a, In a way, he's a wisdom keeper because of the tremendous efforts he made blazing trails early on and the extensive nectar he was able to taste and in a way, in a Campbellian way, how he returned home with the elixir to write all these books, curate beautiful art exhibitions, really participate in both academia and in t teaching and coaching. He would go on to pay it forward by establishing a Tibetan studies program in Nepal where he was the director, bringing young folk newer generations into the fray and into the fold and exposing them to the magic that he was so blessed to encounter. Later in the conversation, Ian and I really get into this idea of the, um, the inner pilgrimage, which I just want to set up now because I've been giving it a little bit of thought, and I think it's really part and parcel um, a motif or a framework that I'm using in my current writing of the book return with the elixir, which is this idea that we need to leave or depart home. We have to leave the safety and kind of go on a descent into the unknown. And from there, we encounter certain challenges, uh, ferocious challenges, and out of which we come back with a kind of boon for others. Now, this is obviously has been laid out by Campbell, Joseph Campbell, in his monomyth. Uh, but I think it is true. And in these sort of podcasts that I'm running, these interviews that I'm running, I am paying one ear to the biography of these people whom I admire and giving them an opportunity to do what's called in the Tibetan tradition a namtar, a basic autobiography, allow them to tell their story. And inevitably, without setting it up and without preempting it and without fabricating it, it is really, you know, once you give someone the authority and the uh, possibility uh, to really give their biography. It does 
inevitably fall into these beautiful, uh, into this beautiful motif where we can trace the steps of the heroic journey. And so, you know, we do that on the outer level, the outer pilgrimage of Ian at 19 going to the Kathmandu Valley and being blown away by the magic. And, you know, there is something to that. I mean, I really think that this is why Ian and I and several others really love to lead pilgrimages because there is something to leaving home, folks. I mean, the actual physical opportunity to leave the comfort zone and to go to a foreign culture and to be immersed is mind-blowing. It is mind-altering. It is mind-shaking. It is disruptive of the norm. And I think that is a truly spiritual known fact and entity. It is desirable as much as it is desirable and inevitable with a psychedelic journey where you also have to leave normal waking consciousness and descend in a way into the depth or the darkness of the shadow. These two motifs I'm writing about in my book, one is an outer expression, one is an inner expression. Of course, later Ian even discusses the third type, which is the secret expression. But I just wanna sort of highlight that now at the outset so that when you go through the podcast and you're listening to Ian, you can kind of get a sense and an appreciation for him treading these three terrains inner, outer, and secret, and following this kind of trajectory, which is, you know, if you just join me in tracing the hero's journey, it, it usually goes in a cycle, but in a way you have to go down before you ascend. And another way that's been pointed out to me in episode one of the Wisdom Keeper podcast uh, with Phil Cousineau was that you have to kind of go backwards before you can go forward. So just think about this as an image. In order to ascend, you have to first descend. And in order to go forward, you have to go back first before you can go forward. And this is a wonderful metaphor. I think it's a really wonderful metaphor. It's one that I'm thinking about as I work with patients, as I bring students abroad, as I look at the larger landscape of the cosmology and the astrology to where we are right now, uh, we are in a way in the midst uh, of a death, rebirth, reboot of civilization right now. And so there's also another kind of stage of dissolution where things are coming undone. Societies, social structures, institutions, economic system, banking system, political system, agricultural system, medical system, everything is kind of fraying and breaking down. And this is a good thing. This is a good thing. I know it terrifies us because we are creatures of comfort. We like to break ground and have security beneath the feet. We like a stable ground beneath our feet. But I think the message of pilgrimage is those that venture forth voluntarily get the benefit of having the volunteer, the vo volunteering to have the ground pulled from beneath them so that they can have a new muscle memory, a new appreciation, become resensitized to groundlessness, as it's called in the Dzogchen tradition, to really see that gr having ground and consistency and something solid is nothing but a fabrication. And many of us are holding on to solid ground where there is none. We've deluded ourselves over the course of decades to, to, to the veneer or the appearance that there's consistency and solid ground when actually the nature of reality, as the Buddha taught, was inevitable change. So when we go on pilgrimage and when we do a psychedelic ceremony and when we go into deep meditative experience, and maybe even during intimacy, I would, I would also uh, venture to, uh, to express that there is this motif of letting go of the comfort zone, letting go of the familiar, letting go of the structure, letting go of the solidity of ego, of self, of known, of, 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 of the known reality, of the identifiable, and, and sort of easing oneself into the process of the unfamiliar. This is what Joseph Campbell called the departure. Now, once you transcend, you cross the threshold, inevitably you're not alone. There are at the, at the threshold and the doorway, there are the doorway guardians. So, you know, it's inevitable that once we leave and depart, you know, all the packing and all the getting ready for pilgrimage and the months that lead up, all the trepidation and the 
anxiety and you know do i have enough internal resources do i have enough external resources to go on this three-week expedition into the unknown all of that is all part of the process once you sign up for pilgrimage even if it's months out the pilgrimage has already begun how do you know that your mind is already undergoing these kinds of releases anxieties fears doubts confusions excitement it's a very mixed bag None of it is, uh, is static or, st or, or, or mundane. It's all intense. And it's, it's really an act of purification. I mean, and what I was saying is an event, eventually you do meet the temple guardians. The angels are awakening. You know, it's not long before in Ian's Baker's biography that he meets some of the re most renowned and uh, transformed beings on the planet and I don't think these things are coincidence. These are the consequence of karmic merit and the act of going forth with a noble heart, having really committed to the path, uh, really shown yourself to be true and honest and vulnerable. You are rewarded with the temple guardians. You are rewarded with the angels. You are rewarded with the, uh, the grace of the wisdom keeper. And so you're not alone. You, are, will, be, you will be guided. Uh, you, you will be ushered in to the, into the process. You will be trained. You will be uh, initiated. And eventually, in Ian's biography, you know, he returns home to have a very profound, mind-altering uh, glimpse of the ultimate nature of reality that he describes in detail. And very honestly, it's not something he would probably do normally, but we had him in a comfort moment there where he felt he could... Um, you know where he could disclose and give a little information and i think i have to i have to really acknowledge and honor ian baker for being one of these people that also when appropriate is ready to break with tradition uh, some of the formality i think he has enough common sense to also see that some of the formality uh, may not serve its purpose in certain contexts. And so that kind of dexterity and flexibility of mind, along with his comfort during the conversation, allows us an intimate access into his experience or first glimpse of awakening. Now, I did kind of pick his brain about the post-awakening experience because I'm a therapist and I'm always looking for how integration happens. And he was um, he was receptive and, and gave some a few details, which I really... I hold on to in my mind because I think, you know, whether it's again pilgrimage or a deep meditative experience or a deep letting go into trust and intimacy and vulnerability or even a psychedelic experience, the post experience integration is just as important, just as valuable, and just as necessary as the departure. From there, we went into some of Ian's um, more treacherous experiences, which, you know, at this point in the narrative arc, we make it to, you know, what I would call the trial. And he's in this wonderful, deep, uh, meditative cave. I mean, it couldn't get more symbolic. This deep meditative cave of, you know, sort of in what he calls a bale, a hidden land, a secret cave, solitary, where it's sort of dank and dark and wet and you know maybe it's the rainy season maybe it's filled with frogs and snakes and the rest of it i mean it couldn't be more emblematic of the lower subterranean of the unconscious we are now on the thresholds in my analysis of ian's conversation we're we're in the in the threshold between the personal and the transpersonal uh, the 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 personal and the universal realm of the archetypes in in Carl Jung's analysis. This is sort of if we were looking at Carl Jung's biography, he basically had himself a psycho a psychic a, a psychic break, a psychosis, whether it be a pseudo psychosis or an actual one, where he ba basically had a lost break with reality, and there you're no longer tethered. You know the wisdom keepers have done their and they have done their service to you and now you're truly alone you know you've been initiated you've been trained you have the master's blessing and then it's down to you and your own mind and this i think is an incredible motif i mean it truly is incredible and just like i set it up in my book it doesn't matter whether you are in a intimate relationship and going to the nether worlds or you are in a meditative experience or you're in a psycho uh, psychotropic plant medicine uh, a psychoactive 
ceremony or you are on pilgrimage, this is the threshold where you cross where it gets tricky and dangerous because there's no more buffer. Uh, there's no more safety. There's no more comfort. It's kind of a second departure. The first departure is leaving the familiarity, but then there's also leaving the breast of the master. And so following the advices of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, Ian Baker goes to practice these intensive Tibetan yogas on the nature of mind. He gets these very exquisite and, and beautifully sort of um, uh, unknown, uh, not, not popularized uh, recommendations and advices to follow. And there he is. As you will see, I won't give it too much away. You'll see what he discovers there in the netherworlds in the archetypal landscape of the dream world and then what it's like to come back. And so from there, I think we then get into a little bit of talk about the return. And of course, before we get to the return, we also get the chance to, um, to discuss, you know, literally discuss the, the convergence or the intersect or the parallel process of psychedelics and meditative experience. Again, I did this sort of a little bit in a prior podcast, episode two with Lama Glenn Mullen. I think it's sort of in vogue and in the collective con uh, conscious right now on the planet. Where do these two um, vehicles intersect? On the one hand, the ancient uh, traditions of the tantras, both Hindu and, and Tibetan, and on the other, the uh, plant medicine and the psychedelic movement. Where do they intersect? What does one have to teach the other? Where are the shadow aspects of both traditions? I, I, I think this is very, very rich territory. I think actually there's a lot to learn from both traditions in a kind of interdisciplinary dialogue. I'm keen to have that with other people. It's something I will continue to bring up. I just think that the Tibetan tradition of some 2,000 2, plus years has something to really teach the psychedelic movement in terms of pre and post preparation. I think in my estimation, as I receive more and more clients coming into therapy, having had a three to five day ceremony, it's my sense that there could be more um, efforts made to shore up the preparatory practices up front. Sometimes these are rushed on the day of or the day before. And certainly the post-integration period, there is some, often some attempt to do that the day after, maybe two days after. But of course, in the Tibetan tradition, there are months or years of preparation on both ends. And I'm one of the people that feel that the gradual nature of human integration, uh, that's why I wrote the book Gradual Awakening, requires these kinds of very conscientious, sensitive, and long time scales. So just, you know, if you're out there and you're, you're a very, you know, big proponent and uh, fan of the psychedelic movement, I mean, that's something that I'd love to converse with. I think um, a little bit more preparation on either side behooves us, makes the process much more metabolizable and meaningful. Ian talks a little bit about the use of psychedelics. That brings us into a conversation that he and I both share. Obviously, he's more senior than me and well-steeped. I've looked to him and asked him on a separate occasion about the intersection between the Greek mysteries and the uh, Hindu and Tibetan tantras in the Swath Valley. He was very forthcoming and eager and interested. We only just touch on that in this podcast, but it's something that features prominently in my consciousness and now as I'm writing Return with the Elixir. What is the connection between the ambrosia and the plant or uh, medicinally spiked wine of the Dionysian traditions in, Gre in the Greek city-states in the Himalayan region of the Swath Valley, uh, the Indus Valley? And what is the relationship between the ambrosia, the elixir of immortality, and the uh, amrita, the nectar, the nectar drop, uh, you can say the dopamine drop, if you will, the elixir in the subtle nervous system that is harnessed and tasted during blissful, uh, bliss void practice in the uh, creation stage and uh, 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 absorption stages of the tantras. These, the subtle body magic the elixirs are within. And so there's this really nice mirror of traditions between East and West, which I think Ian points to. 
you know, towards the end of the conversation, which I really, really enjoy and get so inspired about, what is the intersection between East and West? And, and how is it that we can all celebrate the mystical aspect again? This is very much missing from a very rational mind and, the, and our, our uber rational approach of the last 300 plus years of the age of reason and the, and, the, and the period of enlightenment in Western Europe. We've become very, very rational. Nothing wrong with rational, although the shadow side of it is that we've lost touch with the intuitive and with the intuitive, the mystical. And so all these traditions, whether they be psycho, psychedelic infused potions and wines from the uh, Dionysian or pre-Christian sacrament to the nectars in the bliss drops in the subtle nervous system and central channel uh, heated by the uh, inner fires during the inner yogas of the Tibetan and Hindu yoga traditions, which Ian is a leading world leading expert on. What are the intersections between the outer and the inner, I think? And, and more importantly, how do these really point to the capacity of the human being to achieve the numinous state beyond reason, beyond conception, beyond language, language um, into, the, into the ineffable. I mean, I think this is a, such a beautiful area of exploration and one that I think the archetype and astrology of the coming age is really about. It's about energy and the ether and the spirit realms and the spirit worlds and the inner energies and the inner explorations and the and the, and the, and the encountering new levels and dimensions of reality. Now, this all might seem hocus pocus, not but five, three or two years ago, but I think now people are becoming more receptive. The This is a symptom of the consciousness of the planet rising. And so I think that Ian's work is perfectly primed and uh, I think he ends the podcast with discussing some of his, his, you know, he's an explorer. He's a psychonaut. And so at the end of the podcast, he talks a little bit about his, his little escapade to, uh, uh, to, uh, to meet with a, a yogic um, keep, wisdom keeper in the, uh, in, in the, the Baal tradition of Hindu yoga and uh, that he's had been initiated in. Well, I'll leave you with a teaser about what was entailed in that ceremony, what was really going on. So in, in any case, I feel like it's a really rich conversation. I really just wanted to spend a little time pointing out this kind of universal archetype of the hero's journey, which involves a departure, a coming into contact with the initiation period with angel beings, the dark night of the soul, and then the coming home. And of course, you know, um, Ian ends with this unbelievable quote, uh, which I think is by T.S. Eliot. And it's, it's really, you know, I, I don't have it before me, but it's such a profound quote um, because it really talks about the pilgrim coming home and, you know, starting, you know, coming home where we started, but bringing with us new vision and new eyes. And I think this is so profound. The return with the elixir, whether it be psychedelic, whether it be meditative, whether it be a pilgrimage, or whether it be uh, post-sexual union in deep intimacy, the third eye is now open. And the world that we once left as naive children or as separate egos or as waking consciousness or as, you know, pre-pilgrimage, you know, uh, tourists, venturers, adventurers, the coming back home to where we started with a new vision. Uh, this is very, very powerful and very, very important. And I say that because in the larger context, and I'll end on this note, we are amidst a transition, the great transition between the Piscean and the Aquarian age. Now, this window is some 80 years so some of us aren't going to see the end of it, uh, but that doesn't matter because with this vision comes a resurgence in our sensitivity to reincarnation. So it might not be you say your name, but your soul will come back. And so whatever we lay down, whatever track work we lay down, whatever fortress building blocks we lay down, whatever foundation we lay for the new world, our soul comes to re-inhabit this world. And so when we return home from a great expedition, and the third eye has been open, 
let us celebrate a new vision of the world that is coming into birth right before our eyes. Let us become co-creators. Let us have responsibility. And this is what is uh, afforded us once we make great heroic efforts to break with reality, to go on an adventure, to break with the norms, to break with culture, to break with, uh, to break with security, to break with certainty. What we come home with is new vision, but also confidence. And the confidence is key. We can ill afford, all of us who are listening to this right now, we can ill afford to let others build the world for us. We have to take responsibility of being co-creators. And the tantras is so exquisite at this, because once you are anointed in the Abhisheka ceremony, you become initiated into seeing yourself as deity. You're no longer bowing down to other deities. You're no longer even bowing down to the external guru. You have awoken within you your own inner guru and your own inner guru's confidence, power, compassion, and, and wisdom, quantum view. And so now it's up to each of one of us, not in a hierarchy waiting for the Jesuses of old to pave the way. Now it's up to each one of us, driven by compassion, uh, mind in its refuge of the quantum vision of reality, the openness of reality. They're having the skill and the eloquence to intervene and build something new for civilization. I personally think this is where we are at. And so let me conclude here. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and indulging me as I give a little bit of my preparation to the interview with Ian Baker. But as I make my way through this, I'm sort of sorting out my own thoughts, not only for the book, but also my activities at the Contemplative Studies program and my intersection with students and friends across the planet. We are in a extremely potent period of time where we can ill afford to be scared or to outsource and to give others, particularly the authority or the old guard, the responsibility to create the world. We must feel responsible, capable, and creative to forge that new world. That is the return with the elixir. Okay, with that, I'll send you into the podcast with Ian Baker. Do enjoy his eloquence and his lightheartedness and his beauty and his synergy and his way of dancing between the realms of reality into the uh, world of the non-dual world of the pure luminous nature of mind. Enjoy, and until soon, all best wishes. So I have the pleasure to sit down with colleague and friend, Dr. Ian Baker, an explorer par excellence, an adventurer, scholar, and yogi, someone I admire and have had the pleasure of a number of times to sit with and listen to. He's been kind enough in his schedule to entertain a little podcast, our Wisdom Keeper podcast, in particular our pilgrimage series. Ian is currently in, is it Scotland, Ian? Yep, it is, up in the Highlands. Mm -hmm. He's in a, he's in the keeper, keeper's house of a great castle, which is stirring my imagination as always, and I'm looking at the mythological aspect of that. He's a, a, a well sought after keeper of, of sacred wisdom. So I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to spend a little time with you and thank you so much for carving out the time in your busyness. Well, it's a pleasure to be back into your mandala <laughs> and, and to explore together the, you know, our shared passion for travel and transformation, which I suppose is really the essence of what the pilgrim journey is all about. That's right. And I, you know, when I first met you, I was uh, struck by some of the commonalities we both share because I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe one of the greatest influences in our mutual uh, venturing into Buddhism included travel and pilgrimage right off the bat. I mean, I, I went to Bud Gaya on the Bud Gaya program, the Antioch Buddhist Studies program when I was 20. Mm -hmm. And I think something very similar happened to you up in Nepal, you know, college abroad program sort of started it off. But, uh, you know, there's always a backstory even to get us there into Asia in the first, you know, in the first mm -hmm. place. So, sure. um, 
you know, I've been having these conversations with scholars and yogis and sort of just having them sort of take us through bead by bead the major milestones of their life that led up to uh, pilgrimage and through pilgrimage and to where they are now. If, if there were it was a bead to start with in your early years or your formative years that you'd want to share, where, where might you begin? Where would we begin? Um, it's funny that you asked that because it's, it really starts with a memory that I don't have, uh, but it's an implanted memory which is uh, when I was very little, uh, my, my, both my parents were the ones essentially who inducted me into my love of the outdoors and to hiking and mountains, mountain climbing in particular. And when I was very young, uh, we went up to the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And apparently, you know, this is a time when I would have spent half the time on my father's shoulders possibly, but I insisted on walking up to a, to a, a, a mountain hut called lake of the clouds that was on the slopes of mount washington so i was very young so i, I really don't have the memory but my mother always remembers it because when we, I, we walked all day took forever got up to the lakes of the clouds and my mother to the hut and my mother asked me what i'd like to go do and i said go to the top <laughs> so in other words there was a, a peak uh, uh, not it was a sort of subsidiary peak to to um Mount Washington uh, that Lakes of the Clouds was situated on. And so I insisted, despite <laughs> having spent the whole day climbing up to this hut, that we would go to the, to the very top of this, this peak. And that was the only way that I sort of found satisfaction. Um, <laughs> so she said, yeah, she said, yeah, that's been the way you've been all the way along. So as I said, it's, um, it started out really with this love of, of mountains and mountain climbing and an orientation towards uh, yeah, reaching the summit as it was. Um, but what was wonderful and is of course um, so clear in mountain climbing is that it's the climb and not just reaching the summit that makes all the difference. So it's that what happens on the way that in a sense is, um, is, is, is has the meaning. It's not like being at the summit of a mountain if you take a, as it happens, you know, you can do in the Alps, take a teleferique or a, or a cable car up to the top of a mountain, that's a very different right. experience than, than climbing up one of its theorets or ridges. So anyway, I suppose that was an early, as I said, a, a pre-memory um, experience, but then that carried through in my whole early, um, early life because uh, going with my parents up to the White Mountains initially, and then later when I was 13 in particular, moving to Norway with my mother and Norwegian stepfather, that introduced a whole nother level of, um, of climbing. And I should say, in particular, when I was 13, it was a tradition in our extended family that my, my grandparents, my mother's parents would take grandchildren on a trip of their own, uh, you know, that they particularly had a passion for at the age of 13, with the idea that that trip would be something that would have a great impact on their subsequent life. So that was something that we all, as children, would start to think about at least a couple of years before the trick, trip actually happened. So when I was about 11, you know, when this trip was impending, um, my, my great desire was to go to Zermatt in, in, in Switzerland to the Matterhorn, because the Matterhorn had become sort of this iconic mountain that, uh, in particular, after reaching it at the age of 13, I had this tremendous desire to climb. And of course, at 13, uh, wasn't really in the cards, um, although certainly scrambled up part of the way, up to, much to my, my grandparents nearly had a heart attack when I came back, you know, with my newly purchased ice axe and having kind of explored the lower, the lower slopes and realized that I wasn't going to do it on my own. But I did go back and at the age of 16 and uh, with my grandparents' assistance, uh, they gave me $100 to pay for a guide. <laughs> and so I was, uh, I went to the top of the Matterhorn at 16, um, uh, you know, very <laughs> appreciatively uh, with, with, a, with a Swiss mountain guide, you know, to make sure that I didn't kind of get off route because it turned out to be actually harder than I had anticipated it to be. But I was quite disappointed to find that I wasn't the youngest person to have climbed the Matterhorn. And I also found out in the meantime 
that <clears throat> much to my greater disappointment that actually someone had climbed it in roller skates and another person had climbed it with a dancing bear. So I, <laughs> so I suddenly realized that despite my having just turned 16 uh, and climbing it, um, you know, that there were others who'd made their mark on the mountain uh, in, in more unusual ways. But the point was really um, that that climb and reading the account of Edward Wimper, who was the English uh, climber, who was the first to climb this mountain that he called, you know, we, we see it as this kind of perfect pinnacle of, of um, you know, that classic archetype of the Alps, but he referred to it as a heap of rubble glued together with ice and of course the mountain is sort of notorious for being unstable in terms of the rock. And you have to go up very early in the morning, you know, when it's still dark with, you know, because by midday, you know, the weather patterns change and you get lightning storms and mm -hmm. lightning comes sort of down the ridges. So in any case, I mention all that simply because <clears throat> it really was this idea of climbing mountains that um, led me ultimately into, you know, led me to the Himalayas uh, and then through that first journey to the Himalayas when I was 19, you know, into the whole world of Vajrayana Buddhism and to pilgrimage connected to kind of spiritualized mountainscapes that then- Before, you know, before we get there, can I, can I pick mm -hmm. your brain about two things? Yeah. Um, was there a divorce in your family at 13? Uh, there was a divorce in my family at the age of 11. 11? 11. So my mother remarried a, a Norwegian, an extraordinary uh, man who was only um, 14 years older than me. <laughs> so it was like having an older brother. And he was extraordinary. Uh, he very sadly passed away this last summer while training for his second crossing on skis across the, um, the, the Greenland ice cap, which he'd done already. 10 years previous to that. He was in his late 70s. He was going to turn 80, and yet he was as venturous as he always had been since when I had first met him. I mean, he'd been south to the South Pole on skis. He'd been to the North Pole from Svalbard. He'd, as I mentioned, it was his second very, very intensive training for this second crossing of Greenland. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in addition to climb, climbing many of the highest peaks and the continents around the world, except for those in Asia. Um, but he was the one who, he was only in his mid-20s, and I was a very uh, completely, uh, you know, uh, willing. So anyway, um, he was the one who introduced me to, to, to mountaineering and uh, climbing and ski jumping and all kinds of other dangerous pursuits uh, in Norway uh, during those crucial uh, period from 13 to 15 in particular. Was there... Uh... Was it a difficult time, the, the separation? And were there other, any other catalysts in your childhood, do you think, that moved you in the direction of really seeking some higher ground, if you want to look at it the metaphor way? Mm -hmm. I mean, in that regard, no. In that regard, it just, the, the, the separation between my actual biological parents just seemed it was a naturally arising phenomena. It wasn't something that I felt it's what was happening, but I, I don't remember consciously feeling particularly troubled by it. I think it was just something that was happening. I was certainly well aware of it. And then when, uh, you know, later my mother met this rather dashing, you know, Norwegian <laughs> adventurer, I was totally taken in uh, myself because of his, you know, his engagement with my sister and me in terms of introducing us to, to the world of mountains and was still very very close to my father and his you know and, and also to in his second marriage to to my stepmother who i'm very very close to as well so i was very lucky in feeling that i had four parents all of whom were extraordinarily different and all of whom were were huge um imprints on my life and i should mention in that same context that my stepmother so this is also during that period of 11 12 you know when all this transition was occurring you know, was also <clears throat> very dedicated to it. So one of the, I think the first experience that I met her was when my father and she came up and we went for a camping trip in the Green Mountains in Vermont. So my first experience of her was, was, was camping and, and hiking. And so as I said, it's really on both sides of my therefore extended nuclear family that, that climbing and mountains and walking and an nature. Adventure. 
yeah. and adventure were were just fundamentally important to all four of them. So, uh, and I only mentioned in particular my Norwegian stepfather simply because he was in particular um, influential in terms of my, uh, introducing me to, to technical rock climbing. At what the was age it, what of, was his name? His name was Avon Rinning. Avon Rinning, and uh, yeah, he was. It was he like was, a, he opened up a portal for you. He opened up a portal, absolutely. And so that was, you know, while we were still living in upstate New York before moving to Norway. So when I was 11 and 12, you know, I was, I had shop in class, I had shop in my, the school that I was going to at that time and was trying to make, you know, these iron pitons in, uh, in shop class that of course, uh, as soon as, they were soldered together, but as soon as you put them into the cliff face, they open, yeah. So many kind of dangerous circumstances were avoided, um, but I also made, I tried to make an ice axe also in shop. Uh, so all of that was really, you know, in the greater sense of pilgrimage about transcending current limits and uh, using the physical geography um, and topography to pursue essentially an intangible goal, which was one of uh, pushing beyond one's current limits and discovering, a, you could say, a new way of being in which, in this case, the vertical world would become as, as, as comfortable, you could say, as the horizontal world that we're conditioned to, to, to operate within. So my sort of goal was to was this vertical world and to habituate myself to its to its sort of uh, obscure pleasures. So I imagine, uh, you know, 15, 16, 17, while you're still in high school, every other second you can scrap together your, your, your vertical, you're heading to the mountains and heading on paths. Well, and... and it really worked that way because in Norway, of course, it was a given. We had, you know, mountains all around. But then um, after two years of high school, ninth and 10th grade in Norway, my father, my father's insistence, but I was totally compliant. Uh, kind of insisted, you know, maybe it was time to go back, go to boarding school in America for, for the last two years of high school so that I'd be better prepared for college in America, which I certainly had all intentions to do. But um, so as a result, when we went off on our kind of grand tour through New England, looking at um, a pro potential boarding schools, so I would have been at this time, I guess, 14 or, or 15, um, then I, my, my, I, I drew a sort of line, as my father reminds me, there was sort of a latitude line. It had to be north and it had to be, <laughs> it had to be above certain, not above certain altitudes, but it certainly had to have very active outdoor programs. And so in the context of that, uh, I was completely taken by uh, this Phillips Academy at Andover outside of Boston because they had a very, very um, sophisticated, what they called search and rescue program that was all oriented towards, um, towards climbing and mountaineering. And, uh, that's what sold me on, uh, on the merits of Andover, as opposed to it's, um, normally one would be guided by its, you know, very, very high academic, uh, reputation. But at that age, it was, it's out, it's a climbing program that, that attracted me. And in particular, just could, while we're following up that theme, all of that came into, I discovered that the orientation program uh, at, or, uh, at Andover for incoming students was rappelling down the bell tower, you know, this old colonial era bell tower, and you were taken up to the top and you were kind of taught how to, to rappel. So it was, it was fundamental to Andover's orientation that you were, wow. you'd push your limits physically. I don't, they don't do it anymore because again, we're, we're in a different era where pushing limits is considered to be violation of human rights you know, or of, <laughs> of adolescent rights. Uh, but at the time, that's what really it's like an in initiation. It was an initiation, absolutely, and it was very, yeah, very physical. And it was, and of course, you're, you're, you know, you have a, a belay rope that's, um, you know, will will catch you in, <laughs> in the case of any adversity, even if you were to let go of the, the rappel rope completely. But the point being is that for most people, this would be a completely new and unaccustomed experience that would put you into a sense of perceived danger, even though that danger was an illusion. So all of that seems, you know, became obviously so relevant in the Vajrayana Buddhist world that we're all, that we're part of, because it's about, you know, how much of what we perceive to be reality is in fact just illusion. And we know that all of it is <laughs> on one level or another. And so I found climbing in particularly interesting that way because of the way that fear functions, even when you know statistically 
particularly if you're you know, if you're not lead climbing where it's obviously much more dangerous but if you're second on the rope and you fall you're going to be be caught and um there you know unless things go terribly wrong um you know you're not going to die <laughs> so but the nonetheless fear comes in and so that fear is an irrational state that actually limits our ability to function um effectively within that particular vertical world where you know our normal world is inverted so I found all of that later on, you know, when I when I went to Nepal and was introduced to Vajrayana Buddhism, extremely relevant. And particularly when we look at practices like Chud, you know, which are about confronting your mortality through your through active and creative imagination. And I had, you know, found that I was doing exactly the same thing, you know, when rock climbing, except that it was maybe even a little more real <laughs> when climbing. Because, right. you know, it's not just like conjuring something in your imagination which we can do but of course what you're showing us is that there isn't always a clear line between what's what we perceive to be real and what we actively imagine and that overcoming that boundary is what where we attain and discover freedom and the same was true i found in, in climbing so it was a wonderful i didn't know that about you and that starting to starting to shape up to make so much sense so and I'm not sure if Bob Thurman went to Phillips Exeter. Or can't, I may, he may have started early. To, yeah, I don't I don't remember. Yeah, whether it was he may have been Exeter or Andover. I'm not sure. But we'll see. Um. So if that's the boarding school experience, then you would have what would have been the leap to college? Which college did you get to go to? I went to to Middlebury College in to Vermont, Middlebury. and also it was yeah. So the climbing continued very actively there. You know, we had. You know, in those days, I, again, I think these things have changed. You know, there were physical education requirements, and you had to to you know, subscribe to uh, one particular sport. I mean, I did ice hockey, which I loved, but more than that, uh, well, there was a group of us who were climbers, and we had to make a petition to to the college um, that our rock climbing expeditions would um, would qualify for the athletic. Uh, requirements. Um, and so that was a very interesting process, but whereby we had to sort of write these bi-weekly, or I think it was twice a month, we had to write reports about our climbing adventures. Uh, and that was usually at a extraordinary um, mountain, a, a, climb, a climbing area in the Adirondacks called Poco Moonshine. That was an, originally um, you know, from an Indian, a Native American it, as well as some uh, local uh, cliffs in Vermont the, on Lake Dunmore that we also put up new routes on with exotic names like reptilian clone blues, simply because we found it engaging to be able to write our reports to the college uh, if we kind of, and we, we developed a, an extraordinary, you know, it was, it was the time. So we had interesting climbing methods whereby one person you know, would be climbing, one person would be laying, and the other person, as I recall, my roommate at the time would be reading Richard Brodigan and other beat poetry aloud. So we'd have kind of, um, we kind of tried to combine, you know, <laughs> it was a rather bohemian uh, climbing experience in those days. It was before, you know, we'd get all of our climbing uh, clothing from thrift stores. And as I said, reading beat poetry as we, uh, uh, as we climbed, climbed and then wrote appropriate reports to the college, which I wish I had access to now because they were, I think, quite amusing <laughs> at the time. And it must have been an incredible time for um, the flourishing of your imagination, too, I imagine. And, and I'm still searching in your narrative there. It, it seems that there's a lot of awe and inspiration and still up to this point, no challenges, nothing that's um, haunting or crippling or or creating pressure or divide inside of you? Mm, no, <laughs> it was always about just going beyond. It was always about just like, this is absolutely fantastic and amazing, but there's always, there's always more. So it was always about pushing boundaries for me at that time. And then, so that really tied in with my experience at Middlebury when uh, it was very, it was traditional at Middlebury that in your third year, uh, so in your junior year, there was a junior year abroad uh, programs. And so those were things that we, you know, all had access to different kinds of, uh, you know, where that might be if we were studying French or German or, or you know, you could, there was a program in Oxford in England. Um, 
but I became aware of under very unusual circumstances, um, uh, the opportunity to go to Nepal on a college semester abroad study program. Give and us the unusual circumstances there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of magic when you find your first seed to Asia. I remember mine, I found a dusty pamphlet cause it was, it was pre-internet a dusty pamphlet in the stacks of the uh, of the religion department for the Antioch Buddhist Studies program. And mm -hmm. I looked down at it and it had images of Burmese monks at the Burmese Vihar. Uh, it must have been photographs from the 80s. It was an old, old thing. Mm -hmm. And it said the schedules was like 4, 30, 5 o'clock wake up for meditation. Something inside of me was like, I have to go and I have to do that. Meanwhile, everybody else is scurrying off to Florence or London. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's the mysterious uh, circumstances under which you found your way into the into the portal of the highway to Nepal? <laughs> well, it was a girl named Cheryl Sanderson that I had a great crush on who was walking out from the school cafeteria her head buried in some papers that she was reading as you know we were kind of crossing doors um as it were and so of course i had the opportunity to say well gosh you know can we nearly bump into each other what is it you're so engrossed in she said well i'm looking through this amazing brochure for this uh this college semester abroad program in Kathmandu, nepal this is 1977 so nepal was still kind of an exotic world at that time and I said, oh, wow, that sounds amazing. And so she gave me the references for it. And I, and I came back to my room and shared that news with my, my roommate at that time, Richard Wiswell. And the next thing we knew, all three of us were uh, registered for this uh, college semester abroad program in Nepal in the fall of 1977. And so to do that, to be able to get credit for that, I needed to, I was at that time actually an art history major. So I needed to discuss with my, my supervisor, my advisor, um, how I was going to do an independent, because part of the program was an independent study project. And so uh, I needed to tie that into art. And so I was actually double major in studio art and art history. And so I said, well, I will go and study Tibetan scroll painting, tanka painting. And that was my, and at the same time, he said, well, that's good, but you also need to do a, um, you know, a different kind of paper that will be in a certain sense more academic. So I said, well, you know, there's all this mountain symbols, mountain symbolism in Tibetan paintings. And so I would like to, uh, because of my interest in mountains, I'd like to, I'll do a paper on, on uh, symbolism, sacred mountains in, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and uh, how they're, how they're depicted in, in traditional Buddhist art. So I that... love it. The story is coming together. I love it. <laughs> it's giving me chills. Yeah. Well, that's how it began. And so, as I said, I had my, you know, the, I had a, a mandate uh, to go to Nepal. So when it came uh, in that three and a half month program in Nepal, uh, we had a whole month designated for independent study. And so during that period, I went up, of course, you know, to wherever the highest mountains were in, in uh, Nepal, which was Kumbu. And I had been through a project advisor that I had uh, discerned in Kathmandu. There was a traditional uh, Tonka painter there, um, Kapa Kaldan, uh, who I went up to stay with and to learn the rudiments of, of Tibetan Tonka painting. And it was amazing because I was learning all that, you know, with the group mapping out the grids. At the same time, you know, looking out at Amadablam and, uh, you know, all of the great peaks of, of uh, it was near Tengboche Monastery. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, that was, it was just extraordinary because it, and as he, as he himself said, it was wonderful because when I was interested in the, you know, in the mountain symbolism and the landscape symbolism, he said, yeah, he said, in the paintings, we're, we're constrained by how we represent the deities. But uh, in terms of when it comes to nature, there's great freedom. And it was very interesting because he had a lot of insight into our personal, let's say, perspectives on what the symbolism was. As you know, with Tibetan art, sometimes the you'll have a wrathful deity with these very jagged peaks and waterfalls crashing into, and then you'll have peaceful deities and the landscape reflects that. So we have that that shidro, the, the, the wrathful, peaceful deities and how those are manifested in different landscapes. Uh, geographically, but they're also 
represented then differently in the way those land, landscapes are, are presented in, in Tibetan Buddhist art. So that I found fascinating. And also the symbolism that he, <clears throat> when I asked, you know, what does it mean when the water, when there's a waterfall coming into a lake and he just described, you know, the whole, the melting of the, uh, the snow caps was the, the melting of the bodhicitta, it was the bodhicitta going into the ocean of consciousness and then the recondensing. So he actually used me meteorological kind of that that's just there around you when you're living in the mountains and you're watching that cycle the, the, the of precipitation and that was really fascinating because then that later led to i said well you know and then there was a, i literally I remember an image of, of millarepa and he described it and it was actually over my head at the time but i remembered it in retrospect where he described yes well you know millarepa was up in this area doing tumo and the tumo it's all about melting of the bodhicitta which is um, you know perceived to be in the you know in the in the in the cranium and so what we see here depicted in the, the melting snow at the top of the mountain and coming at the waterfall is the central channel coming down into this pool of water at the bottom which is in fact you know the amrita and the, you know which the fire <clears throat> is then so you got this whole sense of the the inner flow, which is the the whole dynamics, if you will, of the practice of tumo or inner fire, was mm -hmm. being represented symbolically and somewhat um, subliminally within the the landscape in which Milarepa was actually being depicted in the scroll. So I found that absolutely enchanting <laughs> and uh, transfixing that you could actually nice. secretly, even though there were secret practices that you know were not supposed to be revealed, they could actually be revealed. Um, surreptitiously and subliminally within art, even when the texts themselves were, were considered hidden, the art, it was kind of just like we have with Yabyum deities, basically practices are, you know, they're right in front of our eyes, and yet they're often obscured by, you could say, secondary interpretations that are very purposeful in, uh, you know, preventing them from those practices from being misunderstood by the uninitiated. So in any case, that was my introduction to the Tibetan Buddhist art and esoteric Tibetan Buddhist practice all simultaneously in the context of high mountain symbolism, you could say. So, I mean, it's fascinating, just that inner little uh, window into your experience with a Tonka painter and like his re revelation or, re you know, casting open the veil so that you can have a, a deep sense of the sort of tantric ethos or mythos. But you're still, I mean, you're 20 years old in Nepal in the late 70s, right? Yeah, 19, actually, yeah. You're 19, and so uh, what was it like? I mean, what else is going on inside of you, and how, how do you think you're, you remember how it was shaping you or looking back how it was starting to shape you? Yeah, very, very profoundly, because I, I, I remember my first day arriving in Nepal, and I said, there was absolutely no question in my mind, this is where I am going to live. <laughs> my whole the rest of my life was mapped out in front of me it was such a sense of homecoming despite all of the exoticness that nepal represented especially back in the 1970s but it was like a spiritual homecoming and i just you know back then it was before pollution it was before all of the uh, you know the the traffic it was before so-called democracy or what nepalis called demo crazy um, because they recognized that this was a form of government that wasn't quite uh, organically arising from their own uh, earlier traditions of, of divine kingship. Um, but the whole place, everything about it just resonated with me. And uh, as a res and, and because of the whole idea of the art, you know, this was a place where stone Buddhas were coming out of, uh, out of the, the streets and uh, art was everywhere. And the painted, you know, it was just, it was just beauty incarnate, both in the, in, you know, in the people and the mountains that were there that you could still see at that time over the temples, because it really was before pollution sort of, uh, unfortunately, set in to a city that was at that time already designated as a, a World Heritage Site, and yet which, because of the, the, the poor administration of uh, development funds were, were kind of, it took the city in, in, in a wrong direction. Mm. But that's that's a whole other narrative. But in any case, it was a place where I felt immensely um, excited. And of course, it was at that time, you know, Tibet was still a sealed world, you know, beyond the mountains, but everything about it was just so 
uh, enticing. And it was also when through my uh, original project advisor who was there, who then I, I wanted to be initiated into to Tibetan Buddhism and to Tantric Buddhism and um, went through sort of two, two stages with that, interestingly. So I went through an initial initiation process with a Kargyu teacher uh, at a monastery in Boda. But I, it's strange. I, I, I haven't really mentioned this before, but it just didn't, I don't know, it didn't really resonate for me. So I went back and I mentioned that you know, to my uh, advisor and he said okay I will take you to, to someone else um, so he took me to see <laughs> Dujim Rinpoche so <laughs> Dujim uh, who had at that time was staying in a small little house in, in Tamil in in, uh, in the sort of center of, of Kathmandu and there was nobody else there we just went in he, we, he my, my advisor who spoke fluent Tibetan and then introduced me you know to uh, Dujim Rinpoche and uh, who was just sitting there, you know, in, in his, in the, you know, with that wonderful sort of scholarly yogic look that he had, you know, with his sort of gray, white gray hair tied in a top knot and his, his, the red and white shawl sitting at his little scholar's desk and just this, you know, this smile that just put the mind into a state of natural expanse. And then I went and I took refuge immediately and he gave me my name, Kuancho Gwangya. And, um, then I was I was in, <laughs> and then wow. he said he says now I will take you to meet the greatest yogi in Nepal. And I said oh okay, so then we went off to Swambu, um, and at the wheelhouse at the the, the money wheelhouse at the base of Swambu, there was this extraordinary um, yogi Lama, and that was Chato Rinpoche. Mm. So. I also had the great fortune, you know, to meet him and this extraordinarily kind of like one-on-one, -on -one, uh, although there were two other people with us at that time, context in which I was immediately just kind of blown away by this presence and the sense of just infinite possibility that he as an individual represented and the kind of pith kind of teaching that he gave uh, in the context of that initial meeting through the person I went with, it was a friend who had come, who was a bit older than me. She was in her already mid twenties, but had come from, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know her, Tara Doyle. Oh, Tara. Yeah. Tara. So I met Chatra Mache with Tara and uh, Tara of course had that background in Zen Buddhism. And so she asked the question, cause all of this was still so new to me. She asked uh, Chatra Mache about uh, about Zen Buddhism and its relationship, you know, to Dzogchen, which of course was his, his tradition. And he said, and I remember just so distinctly, because that was sort of, all of this was very eye-opening to me. Uh, you know, he said, I mean, he literally put, had an egg at that time that was just sitting up on a shelf and he put it on the table in front of us and he just kind of spun it. He said, he said, Zen is absolutely perfect. It's the, it's the natural state. There's nothing, he says, but it doesn't have handles and therefore it can slip away from you. And it doesn't, and so we need skillful means and the Vajrayana is what provides the skillful means for opening the egg and realizing this primordial luminous uh, nature in which all things are primordially united. And so he said, Dzogchen is part of Vajrayana and it has these skillful means and Zen, there's, it's faultless. And if one has the great fortune to be able to recognize that nature of mind without, you could say, need for handles and conceptual elaboration, mm -hmm. then, then Zen is perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, he said, it, you know, uh, he said, there's no contradiction. But, and remember, really, this is when I was 19. He said, no contradiction between Zen, between Dzogchen, even between Madhyamaka. He said, the, I remember him very distinctly. The view is Dzogchen, is Dzogchen is essentially that of the, of the um, you know, that we also have in, in, um, in Madhyamaka. So, and again, he was very, very much presenting a, um, a, a, a view in which emptiness uh, was the bottom line. And yet how one you know, negotiate intersects, and, yeah, intersect, how those all intersect and how you, in a certain sense, and the same with Mahmudra, how you, how you actually work on the path, which brings us, of course, it's the pilgrimage, you know, how it, when the goal is the same, but there are many, 
you can, there's, you know, in climbing language, there's the North wall, the South wall, the East wall, the, the West wall, and they all have different qualities. And, and one may be because of one's innate disposition um, or capacity um, inclined to approach that um, ultimate peak, if you will, the Ati uh, from one or another perspective or point of view or practice. And that's always what Chatra Mbache said, as you may have seen, and so much of what, you know, has been, you know, the very limited things of his that have been kind of, kind of ended up on the internet. It's like, practice according to your capacity. And he always guided people in that way. So he would never push people beyond what they, he felt they were capable of, but he would always push people to actually embrace what he felt they had capacity for. So that would mean that he would teach people very, very differently. And that would mean that therefore that could get confusing. If And so it was, again, it, it was a, a full on case for why in Vajrayana, you know, the, the, the intimate relationship between the teacher and the guru is something that is, is very, very specific and why the path as it's practiced in, in reality is often very different from what we see when it's outlined in a, in a textual form. You know, where you follow is one, you know, it's, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, but, you know, a teacher, at least it was for me with Chatra and Bache, he would send you off to do, and then quiz you, you know, then you'd be, then you'd have to you'd download your, what your experience was. And then based on that was your next set, set of practice. And it may be something, you know, I'd never heard of before. It was nothing that it was ever, you know, something you could anticipate because it was something that was taught through his own direct realization and recognition of where mm -hmm. that person and the same way with other persons was suddenly doing a practice like, well, hmm, why are they doing that? And I'm doing this. And, but <laughs> the great thing about it was that for me, the absolute recognition of, at least for me, the, the power of the, you know, the teacher, the guru, uh, and the guru, of course, as Chatram Sri always and ultimately said, you know, it's, it's, it's a principle of our own wisdom mind that is nonetheless can be at its best reflected in the outer teacher. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, there's great rooms as, as we've seen for, you know, abuse of that uh, absolute devotion, if you want to call it that, and unquestioning, uh, especially in, a, in an age now when people have gurus they've never actually even met in the flesh, and, you know, and... And unfettered access like you had to Dujam Rinpoche one-on-one -on -one in a small room in Tamil, or, you know, Chachra Rinpoche with just one other person at the base of Swayambu. I mean, these are encounters that are so rare. I mean, you're, you were part of that first wave of Westerners having direct access to these lamas where now it's so hard, you know, mm -hmm. it's just what a, what a magical time for you really to yeah. have that contact. Mm -hmm. uh, so I imagine, you know, those first encounters made such an impression, but you did have to go home because the pill, the, uh, the program was only three and a half months. So, you know, Oftentimes, returning home from these kinds of things, at least in my case, in the pe in the people that I've talked to after these programs at this kind of tender age, first impressions, it's like being hit by a nuclear bomb. It completely transforms you in ways you don't, you know, quite can't metabolize right away. And then you end up hitting the campus again back in Vermont. And, you know, what's the what's the coming home like for the first time coming back from nepal and then i'm, I'm sure shortly thereafter you made your way back to to meet chatrul mm -hmm. again i mean that's that yeah. i i haven't heard you say that but i imagine that's how it went sure no what was absolutely coming back was actually very very um positive in the sense that i it completely revivified do you ever suffer <laughs> well, no absolutely i, well, I have Plenty, I can tell you ultimately, but um, but what happened when I came back was just I, I was very very fortunate at Middlebury. Uh, I mean, I changed my major. <laughs> I want to change my major uh, because of you know this whole introduction into to Buddhism, and uh, we had an extraordinary professor at Middlebury. It was actually Stephen Rockefeller, so he was one of the Rockefeller brothers who. Uh, unlike the others, had he was he was the main professor of comparative religion at uh, at yeah. Middlebury. He also had a zendo uh, the back of his house uh, in Middlebury, and he was uh, employed by the college on a salary of one dollar a year. Uh, and so it was his passion 
to, and he taught a course that I then took on, on the first semester that I came back from Nepal called Mysticism East and West. It was absolutely life-changing. And wow. it was a way of bringing everything I'd learned in Nepal into kind of a larger perspective, simply because I was able to see, you know, what lay at the heart of these tradition was the, you know, the mystical experience, which in a certain sense went beyond the religious language and framework uh, and mythos into a kind of into the mysticism behind the mythos. And so in that context, we not only had the opportunity to, to sit uh, with him at the, his personal zendo at his home, but then a few of us who were interested, uh, we went off to, uh, I think it was a spring break, uh, to, um, to Rochester, New York, where his teacher, Philip Kaplow, uh, who wrote The Three Pillars of Zen, taught and so we all we participated in an intensive uh zen session which essentially is as you know uh at that level we're talking about you know a kind of shamatha vipassana or shine latong in tibetan really just intensive uh sitting practice um that introduces directly the nature of mind there's a there's a lot of common as you know uh language between zen and dzogchen mm. and i had also one of the most profound Kind of awakening experiences in the context of that um session that that just totally changed my life and it changed the way that i then related to every other course that i was doing at middlebury at that time whether it was i remember a course in continental fiction so everything all the papers i had to write whether it was for you know uh literature whether it was my interest in art it was all oriented around you could say this you know the nature of mind and the the the, the mystical experience um as it was um in a way introduced to us uh in the context of an academic course on mysticism east and west looking at you know in, in the in the western tradition saint john of the cross you know the um the cloud of unknowing you know extraordinary things where you begin to see the the, the crossover between that and particularly in zen so all of that was very very positive and Climbing continued to be a great passion, and somehow or other, I, you know, my climbing improved immensely after that experience. Somehow, in the Zen at the Zen Center in in uh, in Rochester, I just my mind was just kind of like. I'd like to ask happened. you. I'd yeah. like to ask you about that session because it seemed you emphasized some mind blowing experience, and then also by synchronicity because of my own recent curiosities about the parallels between East and West, particularly the uh, cult of Dionysus and the Mahasiddhas. I wonder mm -hmm. if you had anything to say about that, though that may take us in a different direction, but I'm just very curious. First, sure. what was that What was that meditative experience like? Because that, that sounded very profound. Yeah. Well, to talk about that, first which you know as we know there's you know convention of course in tibetan buddhism you know talk about your meditative experiences but sometimes i think that's inhibitory and not helpful and since it was so long ago i can talk about it almost in the third person <laughs> so uh i had a um it was in the on the third day of the session and um just sitting and in that practice uh it's uh, in that particular rinzai form of zen you know you're focused it's breath following the breath but very much with the with the mind concentrated you know four finger widths below the navel so essentially where in vajrayana the three channels meet and so even though i wasn't in a, even though i've been introduced to all of that in in nepal i was still just following it completely in the context of uh, how it was being presented in in this particular uh school of zen uh, but i had a just an experience that I mean the, the best way I can describe it I just felt my whole body felt like a you know a soda bottle that had been shaken up and then suddenly with the cap taken off it was just this complete eruption of you know for lack of a better term the central channel mm -hmm. and then we had immediately after that a walking meditation and I remember you know walking out in the garden and everything I was perceiving and seeing was basically from from the hara you know from this meet juncture point mm. and it was just profound i mean it was like a one level so embodied and at the same time so transcendent it was um joyous and at the same time extraordinarily calm and when i 
you know, we had our period that, uh, where we would then meet with the teacher uh, who was headed uh, and basically described, he said, this is um, Kensho, uh, there's a kind of pre-awakening. And he said, please try, can, try to stay now. What do you have scheduled? If you can stay with us now, it'll be very, very beneficial and you consolidate this practice. But it was very interesting because I had, uh, so of course, as appealing as that was, uh, Right after this, I had two other friends, one of whom was in that same uh, retreat where we were going to go off to the Schwangunk uh, Mountains in uh, upstate New York, not far from where you are, um, well, a little bit further to the northwest uh, for, you know, uh, rock climbing that intensive that last weekend before we'd have to go back to the college. So I, I, I decided to continue with that agenda, but that was amazing because the experience was so had altered something in my whole biochemistry so i was able to climb at a level that i'd never climbed Ooh. before in the schwangongs in particular there was a, a climb that i'd always um looked towards it was called the name of the climb and as you know roots climbing roots often have unusual names and the name of this route was called cascading crystal kaleidoscope and, oh, and uh, I've never been able to finish that leading it before, but in this case, just, oh, it just, it just happened. It was like the climbing happened effortlessly, fearlessly, kind of mindlessly in a strange way. And yet with tremendous precision. And when I would meditate, I was just, you know, back into the, into the hara, into this juncture point, um, you know, with the three channels in, in terms of Vajrayana. Uh, so it was an incredible experience for me of the, the link between deeply embodied practice, even though embodied, I mean, in this case, without it, with an absolute stillness, and then actually taking that practice into um, behavior, yeah. <laughs> whether we want to call it or into action, as we call it in the tantric tradition, the charya, you know, where you yeah. test your realization by bringing it into the world and then in the zen tradition of course has it too where you know you're kind of if, if you become too habituated to being a, a monk and staying in that kind of comfort zone of resting in the nature of the mind rather than being what the tibetan tradition sometimes encourages people well once you've experienced the nature of mind nothing better you can do than just stay in a cave for the rest of your life and rest in that nature well that's that's an interesting interpretation it's it's contradicted by what we see in the early tantras saying well no once you realize it then you take it into the world and you manifest through with with total bodhicitta uh you know, with a compassionate orientation you act and engage with the world and not only is that as an opportunity to bring realization into everyday action um but it's also a way of yeah just just engaging with with the wonderment of of the illusory world if we want to think of it in such terms and so that always had a much more organic appeal to me than this idea that oh it's almost as if well yeah now that you've seen what the nature of mind is you see that anything you might pursue in the world will only lead to dissatisfaction therefore do nothing just rest in the nature of mind for the rest of your life and that would be the best possible use of your precious human body i could never really buy into that mm -hmm. and it was certainly nothing that chatra Mache or dujan Mache ever ever spoke about and it was really like oh once you know the nature of the mind then there's no limitation uh to what you do as long as it is completely informed by the natural recognition you know the rigpa the, that state of awareness which is luminous blissful and uh, and intrinsically altruistic in its orientation uh so that is where you know so for me climbing was the charya phase at first in this case and then immediately it was about finding a way back to Nepal so I could reconnect with the lineage that I'd left there. And that my media for that was, um, was the Explorers Club in New York. And I applied for a grant, it was called the Youth, Explore, uh, Youth Explorers Fund, I think it was. And you could apply for that in your last year of college for, and I applied and I wrote an application to uh, study the intersection of shamanism and tantric Buddhism in the Nepal Himalaya. So, wow. and, I, and I got the grant, uh, and it wasn't much, but it was enough ultimately to get me back to to the Himalayas, to Nepal, to Chhatrapati, and because the originally in Sikkim, which is where I had applied for the, the the project to be based initially, with the idea, 
connected to the hidden lands, which um, of a Bayou, a hidden land in Kanchenjunga, which is part of the same story, but uh, one we haven't really kind of explored yet. Well, let's get there. So you're back there with Chatrol. We'll, we'll we'll leave we'll leave the intersection between East and West and the Dionysian mm. uh, mysteries, the mystery schools. We'll leave my fascination for another because it's just so compelling. And I'm, I know you're short on time, and I just want to. Yeah. Uh, so far, I'm just reveling these biographies. To me, they're they're so captivating. I mean, they're so rich mm-hmm. and. You know, you also show some humility. You don't really want to share your meditative experience. On the other hand, I don't. I, I, you're, you've never been one to posture as some great, you know, realized being. And I, you know, I so I assume also there's there is both this breakthrough and this carryover flow state into the into the hiking that doesn't also just completely eliminate all your sum scars. You're also you're also someone that probably went through a lot of metabolization of an mm. integration of seeing the nature of things and also working with whatever hindrances, you know, they don't just burn away. So that, that, that is also very interesting. I mean, if you're going to report having Kensho, then I think it's also responsible for, to share like how it was actually applied to, to being human and to having shadow and, and to yeah. having some scara. um, do you remember any of any anything like that? No, no, absolutely. And it was, you know, as as, as we know that you know, Kensho is just sort of a taste of, you know, of a. It's not, not, you know, it's not final, realized state, but it does give us, a, you know, an embodied glimpse, if we will, into where we're headed, and actually to, I would say, kind of reorient the default mode, what's often called the default mode network, but. You know, it's that we actually have an alternative default mode, which is actually realization. And so, if we if we take the result as the path, which is the orientation of zokchen, then the default mode is actually the state of luminous luminosity and awareness, which is actually our 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 true condition. It's our Buddha nature. So, if that becomes, and then we we view samsara as when we fall from that recognition, which is our innate sense of being is in that rather than something that we have to strive for by removing you know it's a little bit like you know when we hold it's like inverting the four noble truths it's like nirvana is our actual natural condition natural and state. It, it, samsara is just what happens when we you know when we lose the plot basically <laughs> so and it occurred to me do you think that people having psychedelic experiences right now are having kind of a kensho and then mis misunderstanding it as a kind of full-blown realization well, I think anybody I know who has integrated uh, these kind of substances recognize it as as a glimpse, and it's not. I don't. I've never met anybody who gets into the delusion that you know there's a full enlightenment that takes place as a result of you know of you know licking Sonoran desert frogs and going into a five uh, D you know five meo DMT kind of state of egoless. Uh, numinosity or you know colorado river frogs or you know it, it's all quite wonderful i think in a certain way that these kind of shamanic uh substances are being explored and integrated in bajiana now in a transcultural uh trans global context i think because we certainly know that the, such substances but less interesting ones i think that were you know in in asia uh, you know, we have access now to to such a range of possibilities in terms of of substances that can aid on the path. Um, but yeah, there's always that danger of inflation that occurs mm-hmm. in any kind of realization, and to hang on to that and grasp around it and re rebuild an ego egoic identity around such an insight. And that kind of goes back into as you were saying before, when I went back to Nepal, then I had uh, just to kind of um, flash forward a little bit, I had the opportunity to meet with His Holiness the Dalai Lama quite regularly, twice a year, one-on-one, uh, for a number of years when I was actually leading the the, the college semester abroad program uh, in Tibetan studies uh, in Nepal that I had originally gone on uh, when I was when I was 19. So in that context, I had also asked, and I was, you know, after I think three years into that program, um, I was going to have a paid leave of absence. It was what they called a sabbatical, essentially. 
and uh, I had to apply for it. And uh, I, my my what I said I would be doing during that time was staying in a cave up in the hidden land of Yomo. So it's quite an interesting sort of submitting my my sabbatical application to be, to be in a cave. And they, an, un, an unheard of sabbatical request. Right, right. And they were all rather amused by it. And they said, well, just tell us what happens anyway. So all of that. And in the context of that, I was went to see His Holiness um, bringing, having brought a group of students there. But then I always had arranged to have a one-on-one -on -one uh, period with him following those um, sessions with students. And in that context, I told him I, I had arranged that I had this kind of next six month free uh, following that, that semester. And I said, I could he advise me? You know, I said, I want to do the practice, whatever practice it is that will bring about the most profound and immediate results. Um, and it was very, very interesting because it, it, it you know, I really, it was an open-ended question. And even though I'd been introduced to Dzogchen, but I had actually, um, you know, taken, you know, I'd done actually the full Nundro at the request of Dingu Kensa Rinpoche, who said, yeah, you can go directly, but it's, uh, which Chatra Rinpoche and others had, but he said, in, in future, it'll be very good if you, if you know the system, so please do. And so I did, but in this context, uh, His Holiness, um, introduced me to a practice and he wrote a small note to give to uh, Dingu Kensa Rinpoche uh, to have him give me teachings on the Kordi Rishan and so on the separate distinguishing samsara and nirvana which were traditionally the preliminary practices for Dzogchen even though they were they're not widely given and they were also something I had never even heard of at the time and so his holiness <laughs> He said, well, he said, you can do these as long as you're in a place where nobody's going to see you. Otherwise, they'll think you're crazy. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what on earth is he giving me? <laughs> and what it did, it, it was, again, just such a profound. And so as I then learned about the practices uh, from directly from Dingu Kensu Rinpoche, and then through the transmission of the Tri Yeshi Lama, that then Dingu Kensu Rinpoche had um, uh, the Norbu Rinpoche give to me. Uh, and then his oral commentary, and then Chatur Rinpoche's oral commentary, and then sending me off into the wilderness, you know, for six weeks to do it. Um, it was extraordinarily profound, because I was sort of moved into what I felt was just, you know, extraordinarily profound um, dimension of a kind of embodied induction into the natural state uh, that we we can read about and the danger always as his holiness dalai lama had said he said it's very easy to misunderstand dzogchen if we approach it just from the mind so it's very interesting what he said he said we approach dzogchen through the body when we do the korde rushin so that was a profound i felt sort of upadesha or kind of uh teaching as well okay this is interesting when we're talking about the nature of the mind uh how is it that you know, we're using the body as the method to reveal the nature of the mind so that we actually therefore embody and encompass the non-dual state in which mind and body are just a single, you know, scintillating continuum in which we don't make that artificial division, you know, until the time of death, of course, and then, you know, we have to understand the body perhaps a bit differently. So in any case, that was kind of my way back to a whole nother level of the practices and um and then you know after that it, i you know so, so six six I, weeks up in a cave i was six weeks yeah in a in a cave up in yomo in a place called pematang which is a kind of inner hidden valley within the hidden valley of uh, of yomo or helambu as it's called in and in was that fall. was that also very blissful and or did you have dark nights of the soul there finally Give me some dark night of the soul. <laughs> well, I had, I had, well, well, let's just say, well, when we talk about, let's just say, benign psychosis, I certainly had that um, in the sense of, yeah, it was very interesting in that period because it, it reached a point where, you know, I'd in the cave, uh, there was rain, it was monsoon time, it was raining, there were frogs crawling up the wall. I mean, it was pretty intense. And, uh, but I had really this kind of breakdown, which is of course natural, not breakdown, but this way, but the breakdown of distinction between the waking state and the dream state and the kind of visionary states arising from the meditative practices, particularly during the inner uh, phase where you're working directly with the lokas, essentially 
with the chakra or energy system uh, along the central axis of the body. During that, that stimulated, it just brought out a tremendous kind of physiological, uh, um, as you say, it just released so much kind of entrapped energy uh, and led to very interesting states. One could call them lucid or one could call them hallucinatory. I would kept hearing my voice uh, being called by kind of what felt like, you know, for lack of a better word, they were female voices. So they were like Takinis. I'd go and get water from the river and blah, blah, blah. And I kept turning around because somebody was mm -hmm. calling me. But of course, I, you know, there was the closest person was, you know, more than a day and a half walk away. Uh, tingling of bells, the sense of presences, the sense of where you lose a sense. Jung, of, Jung might call this the animus, uh, the moment of meeting the animus. Yes. So the anima was a presence, and certainly the Dakini principle and the anima principle have their commonality, as as does the shadow. <laughs> and the shadow was just the eruption of, um, you know, that which we have not engaged with. And so by by, in a way in an intentional context of, iso of isolation, not necessarily sensory isolation, but also sensory expansion through the kind of psychodynamics uh, and psychodrama of the outer ocean, and then moving that into the interior of the body from its outward expression, you know, you've suddenly re, you've just released any sense of, of conventional um, way in which we conceive of of, of reality manifesting itself. And so of course that is the point that therefore the illusory body, which is really just the illusory world, because uh, to actually just, you know, of course the body is illusory, but the, any, no more or no less than everything else manifesting as numinous illusion, um, mm -hmm. but not in a sense of it, a derogatory sense, but of a, of a, of a field of infinite possibility, really. Um, and I think that's sometimes you know, that may be my idiosyncratic um, take on it, because sometimes we see, I feel a negativity bias comes in and we say, oh, it's all an illusion, therefore don't engage in anything because it's just an illusion. Well, no, that's not really what I take from it. It's nothing I ever felt that Chantra Rinpoche ever <laughs> uh, taught me to take from it. It's like, it gives you the freedom to play and to it's explore. Engage, yeah. To engage. Seems too nihilistic. Seems like it falls off the other, the deep end, yeah. instead of a true non-dualism. Exactly, and that was always how Chantrim Shay taught. Was you know was also to engage, and you know whenever I would go to Pamukka or to Tibet, and he'd give me little projects. You know, it was like you know you had your task at hand, and they were often tricky ones. You know, and they were ones in which you know it wasn't just about oh go and just meditate as much as you can at this such a place it was like no get these images of these manifest you know of the eight manifestations of Padma Sambhava and these statues in the potala where you know you're strictly not allowed to you know or you know go to kailash uh and because even though it's not the year of the horse but go into the inner sanctuary because life is short even though you're supposed to go around the mountain 13 times in other words breaking me out of my rigid perception of what is acceptable allowed or not allowed. Yeah, yeah what's yeah. acceptable or not acceptable uh and challenging at the same time because he somehow you know he knew he could push my limits in those ways and that i would find that vivifying rather than and this is way, where your something. early years in your biography of the climbing i think comes into play again Chachal Rinpoche recognizing each of his students, what their capabilities or dispositions was, sent you into the six-week closed retreat in the in the mountains and sent you on a wild goose chase because he understood that you had a long legacy already of pushing your limit. So this is, I think, the yeah. biography is starting to come full circle here. It's yeah. amazing. Well, that's certainly how it felt. And um, it was... You know, and all of that was so, you know, wonderful in that, you know, the relationship with Chatra Mishi, even in its more everyday aspects, you know, whether it was meals, whether it was, you know, outings, if you want to call them that, but everything that he did was a teaching. So just being in his presence and, you know, how he walked was, you know, which was almost a half run sometimes, sometimes supported. It was like, 
is like low flying. It was it was amazing. And um, so this kind of deeply embodied presence that he represented and that he in a sense imparted in a way that he and also kind of um, encouraged clearly uh, both formally and informally just through his own presence and behavior um, was something that you know was when I look back on it you know it was just such a profound opportunity as you said in those kind of golden years when you know, access to teachers such as Chatur Rinpoche or Dujar Rinpoche before that, or even, you know, Dilgo Norbu, yeah, all of them before they became, you know, more and more, well, in the case of Tin Norbu Rinpoche, you know, completely sequestered, um, you know, in, 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 towards the end of his life. But uh, when there was that open expanse in their own expression of their everyday lives, it was like you were taken into other worlds. And that was how it was also early with in, in Boda and in Kathmandu, you suddenly you were on an outing, you know, in a taxi going, you know, it's like you didn't know what was going to happen. And mm. that was this extraordinary adventure of just being kind of in enlightened presence, being, you had to just be prepared for anything that they might say, do, or demand in a sense. And that was just, you know, so enlivening in a sense and humbling at the same time. Uh, that, yeah, there's just nothing, <laughs> there was nothing like it. Uh, so, yeah, so that was for me, you know, why, you know, living as I then did in Nepal for those years was, 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 uh, was so wonderful. Magic. 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 And then, you know, it's sort of a, I wouldn't say a fallen world at the moment, but, you know, Nepal is not quite what it was and nor are the great beings who were there there. And of course, many are, and there are many monasteries and great teachers who either are based there or go through there, but uh, it's not as at least, I, I have a feeling it's, it has a different flavor, perhaps, but that's not any way to denigrate, you know, the experience that people can have, but still tapping into that incredible tantric mandala that is the Kathmandu Valley, which really is, you know, when we talk about pilgrimage, it's you know, it's, it's not linear. It's not from one point to point A. It's travel and transformation, but that is in a certain sense where we take that orientation from the center of a mandala and then we can head out in any direction because it's always about, you know, to use the term that you were saying, you know, we go back to the beginning to go forward. So that in a, in a sense, when we think of it as the mandala, it's about, you know, recognizing ourselves as the deity, as the divine uh, source. And then the journey out is about sort of testing and uh, sharing and expanding uh, in all directions forward simultaneously in this kind of nonlinear uh, way. And wherever there's, and then when if you sort of reach a point where then you're always coming back to the center, it's almost as if you're in the center and there's like a rubber band that takes you out. But the, the reference point is always the center. And then, then there's, no, there's no limit to the infinite possibilities of uh, where pilgrimage might take us. Yeah, it's so wonderful because I, I mean, I think we're coming up on time and I just want to wrap it up with the, uh, mm, sure. we can use this now. So we, we've, we've covered pilgrimage in a number of different ways. And now we can synthesize a little bit because I think the, the outer inner and secret pilgrimage have in a way all been touched upon in your biography you know, first venturing to Kathmandu might be the outer pilgrimage and your exposure to Dzogchen, the inner, and, you know, what you were doing in the cave in terms of access to the subtle subtle nervous system, maybe the secret. Uh, and, you know, you reference this quote that's come up in my interviews and discussions with with people on the podcast. The idea of, in order to go forward, we must go back it comes in these three forms too, you know, the outer, the inner, and the secret. It's there in the sense that in order to go forward in your life, you, you had to take a portal back in time into a magic world. The, the, you know, the, the young Ian Baker at 19 went back into, might have been the Middle Ages, it might have been all the way back to the Buddha. You know, the mm -hmm. Kathmandu at that time was like a portal back in time. In order to go forward in your history, you had to go back in time. But then... Yep. You also referenced when you were talking about the Tonka painter up in the mountains, the condensation or the the cycle of energy replicated in the Tonka mm -hmm. also is a is a way is a metaphor of 
almost an alchemical process of something being reduced in order to be reborn or the death rebirth. Yeah. But that that's transfigured on the subtle nervous system and then represented as a iconography as uh, iconographically as the as the as the aspect of nature. So mm -hmm. it's there there again too this idea of going back in order to go forward. Uh, so I just if you have any thoughts if you want to synthesize your experiences that you've discussed thus far with that motif and, and use it as a as a as a as a seal a way of sealing our discussion I'd love to hear your thoughts and you know what it, what relevance it does to maybe listeners in the pandemic right now I also see it as a very archetypal water of rebirth that we're going through I mean the pandemic feels to me like a complete reboot there's a chance of us really metaphorically dying in a way to an old system and yeah. and and are you know are we going to retain sacred wisdom culture in order to move forward is one of the questions that this podcast really tries to present. I'm inviting guests like you who are lineage holders in a way, because during this reboot, are we going to go back and restore and revitalize and remember, or are we going to move forward blindly is a choice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, those are extremely profound and not just important, but I'd say essential questions that you're asking, you know, in in a larger sense. That I'm I, I'm very grateful to try to you know contribute some words to the formation of a you know the collective response that I think we all need to that question of you know it's really it's funny I just having this flash before me now of Gauguin's uh, painting of. Uh, that he, when he went off to the magical world of Tahiti, you know, in the early 1900s, and his one painting is called, you know, who are we, where have we come from, and where are we going? Which really is, in a certain sense, the eternal question that we ask ourselves in any context, because in his sense of what he, I mean, there are many aspects to his experience in Tahiti, but it was a kind of return to the source, and he very much presented it as this kind of Edenic world that called into question the whole trajectory that kind of the, the Western world had taken after the Industrial Revolution, et cetera, and what he was celebrating uh, seemingly in many aspects of his work was this kind of primordial world, which was prior to this kind of the industrial uh, experiment. And so certainly when we see so much of what's happening with the pandemic today, we can argue that a lot of that is, you know, almost an inevitable consequence of the degree to which we have impacted nature and, and tinkered with it in ways that bring about these kinds of new viruses and variants and the degradation of the, of the natural world in which we are inseparably a, par a part of. So when, if we look at that, you know, the question that you're asking, you know, what way do we go back uh, in order to move forward? So I, one thing we didn't, uh, we, we've discussed it before, so, but I'll just mention it sort of in closing here is the idea of the hidden lands, the Deu, uh, which are the Tibetan idea of, uh, of place on an outer level, there are places in nature where that, that pristine condition of the elements uh, remains and therefore is sympathetic with our and resonant with our own internal psychophysical elements. And then on an inner level, it's exactly as you described before, we have the, that same hidden land is on an inner level where our subtle nervous system comes into sympathetic resonance with the, the outer kind of a spiritualized geography or, or, or a geographical expression of, of a, a spiritual dimension. And then on the secret level, and particularly in the innermost secret level, so what in Tibetan would be called the Yang Sung level, then you're entering into this non-dual state, which one could argue is actually our default condition that we rediscover and realize when we take the path all the way to the end, we actually return to the beginning and in a certain sense, know ourselves for the first time. And that's, of course, you know, that wonderful quote of T.S. Eliot, you know, in uh, in the wasteland, you know, to you know that the end of our exploring will be to return to where we started and know it for the first time. So it's this conscious uh, recognition that our own natural state is actually where we're headed, but we head to it ironically by you know a kind of inverted movement in which the beginning is the end, and that is the non-duality. It's like where even in in you know one way of 
pointing out in the nature of the mind, of course, is to look outward, but gazing back simultaneously so that you're in a certain sense, you're inverting your own optical instinct in order to actually enter into a kind of uh, koanic <laughs> um, state. And so that I think is, you know, the ultimate hidden land therefore is not something that relies upon some pristine sanctuary, you know, whether it be in the Northern parts of, you know, the Scottish Highlands or a remote part of the, of the Himalayas, it hasn't been found, but it's, it's within us and it's what we bring, how we transform the world and, and how it manifests through that uh, abiding within that non-dual vision, recognizing that that pristine state is a condition that because it's part of our own intrinsic mind stream uh, mm -hmm. is also part of what through pure perception and pure vision, uh, we therefore then begin to see in the world around us. So that calls upon us to, you know, the enormous sort of intellectual challenge of trying to see what's happening in the world today now as, as okay, <laughs> which is of course a huge challenge intellectually, emotionally, and just existentially, because how can it be okay when we see a world that's kind of imploding and closing down rather than expanding and opening up? How can we how can we embrace that? How can we embrace it on practical terms in terms of um, you know, how, we choose, how we engage it now in this kind of metaphysical world of Zoom uh, conversations rather than being able to meet at your home, for example, which we might have been able to do under, under better, better circumstances? Uh, how do we look forward with hope and at the same time with, with um, beyond the hope and fear that, of course, Dzogchen tells us is the ultimate trap? Because as soon as we're expect, you know, if we live in the state, you know, of expectation, we're already separated from our own moment, you know, from our own presence and our own reality. So I just want to say, because I, I would love to hear your closing comments on all that, but I wanted to come back just in my kind of closing, or, or you know, depending on on the time, but just because I do think it's so important, you know, when we've been exploring what can seem for so many as an exotic world of, of tantric Buddhism in the Himalayas. But, you know, more and more when we look at, when we talk, think about the hidden lands, we think of this hidden, you know, legendary land of Uriana that was essentially on the, on the silk, ancient Silk Road between East and West. We see that there were actually traditions of Dionysus in the upper Swat Valley at the time, even when Alexander the Great came through in the third century BC. Therefore, we begin to think about ways in which to engage in, you could say, the Vajrayana view is a accessible way of, of engaging with our own sort of Western tradition of a kind of refined and distilled Dionysian vision, which of course we also have in Christianity. You know, that it was also, there's so many parallels between the life of, of Christ and Dionysus, the whole idea of turning water into wine, this idea of ecstatic celebration, the early church before it was institutionalized, when it was something, you know, the agape, the love feasts, quite similar one imagines to, you know, the Gana Chakra of the, of the Tantric Buddhist tradition. So if we look at that and try to, you know, a sense of returning to our sources, you know, in all of these traditions, whether it's Vajrayana Buddhism, whether it's mystical Christianity, um, you know, whether the Shaiva traditions, we're really looking at a way of embracing what is that life force? What is that source of wonder and, um, and celebration and intimate human connection that was, it has been expressed in all of these traditions so powerfully and wonderfully, and it comes out through the art as well. So I think, you know, to me, that's really something that excites me deeply. There's a book that I've just become aware of by uh, David Gordon White, you know, who wrote The Alchemical Body, another book called Sinister Yogis. He's a, a great uh, scholar of yoga, uh, professor, and has a book that he has just done called Demons Are Forever, <laughs> which is interesting. Demons spelled D-A-E-M-O-N-S. So in other words, demons, demons yeah, as yeah. the you know, the genius in us, the, the, what we project sometimes as uh, forces of empowerment. And so what that book, and I forget the name of the subtitle, I literally just ordered it last night on Amazon, but it's about these uh, common threads of, you could say, numinous um, mysticism along the, the Silk Roads, encompassing both the Vajrayana Buddhist traditions, the the, the, the Shaiva traditions of, of Hindu Tantrism, the Shakta traditions, and what we have in the Dionysian traditions, 
in ancient Greece. So I think that book will be interesting. As I saw in the review of it, it opens up dialogue about areas to it. He does it from a historical point of view, but he held in what I just saw in the review or the interview uh, connected with the book, this idea, it opens up the possibility of looking at the evolution and trajectory of these spiritual and religious traditions that developed along the Silk Road um, by understanding the deeper history in the way that these traditions were, were interconnected and cross-fertilizing throughout their, their genesis. That's fascinating. And I don't think there's any coincidence that you're interested in that. And that's, I think it's in the collective unconscious. I mean, I think it's just part of the archetype of where we are in time and space, astrologically and cosmologically, these connections are starting to be made. I mean, I've been devouring the immortality key by uh, mm -hmm. Brian Maris Marescu and his connections between Dionysus and Jesus. And that led me uh, along the silk route that you're referring to and, and referencing this other gentleman's book. Uh, mm -hmm. And what is the connection between Amrita and um, uh, Ambrosia? And, you know, what is the connection between the Dionysian schools and the Mahasiddhas? And you've so eloquently pointed them out. And while some of these traditions are far gone or have been subjugated into mere kind of, you know, superficialities, I do think the Tibetan and Tantric representations of these lineages are still very much active, which, mm -hmm. which I think they provide, you know, it's one thing to get a historical survey. And I think all of us would appreciate clarifying the importance of them from this kind of philosophical but your story is so compelling and i think the vitalization of the mahasiddha tradition that still exists today is important in the sense that it can provide that visceral embodied experience now for us yep. I mean, it's you're hard pressed to find a dionysian uh, or bacchanasian uh, feast to join um, on the other hand, I think also the psychedelic movement or renaissance that's happening may may very well be another avenue in, uh, but there I think the danger is it may not be grounded in any very, you know, coherent system of thought, which right. there, there I think is the shadow or the danger of some of the psychedelic movements, sure. you know, so this is where I think, you know, part of my research for my new book is really to bridge is to bridge the uh, Mahasiddha tantric tradition with Jung, because I think Jung provides a very sound framework for mm -hmm. the for what's happening in one's consciousness and psychology, and and threaded in with the Dionysian experience. Uh, but it's been a fascinating conversation. I could talk for hours and hours and hours with you, uh, Ian, and I just want to say that it was um, a real a real privilege to get access into your personal story. I I've. I usually do enjoy your podcasts wherever you may be a guest, but uh, we did spend a lot of time just sort of with your backstory, and I, I really appreciate you being so generous with us with your time and also your your inner experiences as you went through the the pilgrimage of outer, inner, and secret. Uh, it was really compelling, and of course, I look forward to many, many future conversations with you. And I just I'm a huge admirer of your work both your scholarship, but your attempt to bring scholarship into conversation with embodiment and um, just a huge champion of your work. And I'm sure all the viewers and listeners out there really uh, join me in, in celebrating your, your, your mm. monumental efforts as a, as a scholar and an artist uh, and as a person who is an explorer of boundaries. So thank you so very much for being on the Wisdom Keeper podcast. Well, it was a, a great privilege, but uh, if, if, could I have a couple moments? Because I, there is something that I would like to mention uh, that I'm literally in the process of planning right now. So when we yes, talked of about, course. Yeah, let's we talked about my past, I'd like to talk about the upcoming, future, upper coming couple months, as, at least as I would like to envision them, uh, uh, Omicron permitting. I've literally been uh, planning a trip back to uh, one of the tantric power places, uh, uh, in Bengal, in India, in West Bengal, Tarapit, where there's a living tradition of, of soma consumption, according to the Yogini Kaula tradition of tantric um, um, Hinduism. But they actually attribute the, it's, it's all based upon the uh, a form of uh, the Buddhist goddess Tara, the Tara Ma in her blue throated form, Nilkanta Tara. And I had the great privilege a few years ago of going there and meeting with one of the last holders of this tradition of Soma 
uh, preparation and consumption, which of course there's been great debate about for, for, for over you know, a couple centuries now. Uh, but in this case, it's a specific recipe that, they, that he holds that within the Yogini Kaula tradition has been unbroken. It's 64 different ingredients, psychoactive ingredients, including ones such as Datura, which are highly psychoactive. And it's a very, very interesting ritual in which in the, in the way that the Soma is consumed, it goes in a circle, male, female, male, female, drinking from these terracotta cups in which the Soma has been poured. It's repeated every hour or an hour and a half. So it's not similar to ayahuasca. It's clearly, we don't, I don't know yet. That's why I'm going back to find out more. I don't, I didn't get at the time all of the 64 ingredients, um, but it's very clear that uh, they are described in, in a way that's very uh, similar to way the early, the Rig Veda describes Soma, where there's this, at a certain point in the, in the intoxication, the blue tide arises, and that blue tide is, is, is in this tradition uh, associated with the, you know, the, the, the great primordial ocean and the churning of the primordial ocean in which Soma first arose as the ambrosial substance. Um, and so it's also very clear in this tradition that these hallucin the, the hallucinations that arise, the manifestation of the goddess, all the kind of protective mechanisms, the using of mantra, the using of breathing practices, uh, as well as the supportive use of ritual to contain these clearly uh, uh, visionary experiences that arise through the use of a, of a psych psychedelic formula. Uh, in a traditional context, which although it's, as they will describe it, it's the Yogini Kaula tradition of the Das Mahavidya. So in other words, the 10 sort of female uh, manifestations of wisdom, but it's also very, very uh, consciously recognized or spoken about that the, the blue throated form of Tara is, it derives from, from Buddhist sources. So this is really something where we should see the Yogini Kaula tradition and the Yogini Tantras of, of Tantric Buddhism coming into kind of a radical convergence with a living tradition of a ritualized consumption of a psychoactive substance to bring about what they literally describe in this tradition as Turiya, the, the fourth state of consciousness. So it's an extraordinarily interesting living tradition of the ritual use of a psychoactive substance at the kind of nexus point of um, Tantric Hinduism and Tantric Buddhism at one of the great power places of, um, of the, the Shaiva Tantra tradition, Tara, Tara Pit, which however, uh, Sakya Trisen Rinpoche has said it was one of the great power places of the Hevajra tradition as well. So to me, th so this is my next sort of phase, uh, we'll be heading off to Asia to, to go back to explore this particular uh, thread because I so think- So are, are you going solo or are you taking a group? I didn't no, catch I'm that. On, I'm just going on my own with uh, one Bengali uh, a woman who, who... When are you going? Um, I'll be going next month in January. Do you need an assistant? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at this point, I have to sort of go along with the, uh, with the program. Uh, and, but I think, you know, once, you know, once this stage is sort of open, then we'll see what's possible. I'm literally just in kind of correspondence now with the my contact for this um, and to see when she feels will be specifically the best dates one of you know two two and how long uh, you know would be appropriate to stay in in this context so it was a wonderful connection that happened somewhat unexpectedly and spontaneously in 2018 when I went there and met this person but it was again because of you know my being an initiate of the kaula tradition that uh he was open to sharing uh wow. tirtanath uh, shared this information um and i'm very very interested in in how you know to understand it more deeply in the context of a power you know powerful places pilgrimage and the journey, the inner journey that's made uh, when supportive substances are used in a ritual context in conjunction with, in this case, he's, when I asked him, I said, well, there are also, I said, besides mantra, there are also visualizations. He says, no, of course, the visions just come by themselves. There's nothing to yeah. visualize. Yeah. So, so <laughs> in a certain sense, one's gone beyond, you could say, what the, you know, the creation phase. There's yeah. not, a, it's not about conjuring. It's about just remaining present and open to this expanse of reality 
that opens in that interdimensional reality um, yeah. once those doors of perception have been been opened uh, through a, a, a ritual substance that goes right back to the roots of, of, of humanity with the Rig Veda. And I think this is what I'm talking about. You can't anymore go to uh, Eleusis to, to drink a potion, but but you can do what you're about to do. These lineages still exist. Although I'm not sure in the Tibetan tradition if substances are used in that kind of overt way. I've had a chat with uh, Lama Glenn Mullen about it. He, he says, yes, there are still substances being used. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think there are, but they are, they're kind of kept hidden. Uh, I mean, even in the Dzogchen tradition, I've met with with great adepts in in Bhutan, where you know I know from the text the Vimanintic, for example, when the Dzogchen visions uh, aren't you know in the second and third visions aren't 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 forthcoming. You can actually take a distilled concoction of datura that's boiled in goat's milk and drop it into the eyes with the hollow quill of a vulture or an eagle's feather. And when I sort of when I actually brought that up. He's got, how do you know that? And I said, well, I, you know, it's from the, it's in the Vimanitik in chapter 14 or whatever it is. He goes, yeah, well, that's a backup. You know, if, if, <laughs> if the other, if the other practice does not work, yes, we, we can do that. We can use that. So uh, with there are, so in other words, there's textual uh, references to this. And therefore there is indication that these, and as he admitted, these are, it is still done. Uh, and also what's in the skull cup and sometimes is, is, is clearly, has been um, psychoactive, but uh, as you say, in, within the tradition and particularly within the monasticized yeah. traditions of Ajayana, it's uh, it's not so. And when I've talked with other lamas like Bakutuku and others, he said, "Yeah, the, the you know the ritual use of wine and so-called beer or chong, whatever, you know, these were not just like it was in the European tradition. These were not just spiked. Uh, these were spiked. These were were as we also see in the in the immortality code." You know, beer was not always just beer. You know, we had we had henbane, we had uh, you know all kinds of other engaging substances that. Um, I'm sensing so Ian that yeah. following your trip to India in January, we may have to follow up the conversation because this 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 now leads into another portal. <laughs> It's a beautiful, oh, well, well, it's a beautiful it conversation, but I also want to just um, plug your also you know, in addition to going on this individual uh, research project in January, in March, April, I believe April, maybe March, April, you're also planning your trip to Bhutan. So we'll make right. sure we have a, a link there to you and Lama Michael doing mm -hmm. a nice, very rare opportunity of a month long uh, uh, retreat and pilgrimage to Bhutan, which is fascinating. The two of you working together to mm -hmm. offer something much more enduring. You know, it's not... You know, people who can afford to take advantage of their precious human life to spend a month in Bhutan with you two are surely uh, yeah. very, very blessed. So I'll, I'll make sure that that uh, is uh, in the links below. Now, again, I'll just also mention at this time that it's, you know, it, it's already full, <laughs> that, yeah. that trip in April. But uh, some people have already asked, and we are looking to uh, repeat it potentially for the month of October of next year. And uh, otherwise, certainly in April of 2023. Good. So just for people who are interested in it, um, yeah, this will be an extraordinary, as you said, opportunity to have a full month of immersion. The first two weeks being intensive retreat and the second two weeks pilgrimage and yeah. looking at how those two work together in, in kind of syncretic unity. So. I love it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I look forward to reconnecting with you and your adventures into the land of Soma. Uh, that mm -hmm. that That is a tantalizing little nugget to leave on. But uh, again, once again, thank you so much for all of your contributions and for sharing uh, so much on today's podcast. Look forward to Great. meeting well, with you again. Thank you. Yeah. thank you for the invitation. And I'll yeah, definitely enjoy the conversations. And uh, yeah, let's look forward to that great unity of Dionysus riding forth on his leopard into uh, the contemporary world, back to our own primordial sources culturally and civil civilizationally. Uh, uh, so all good. Uh, all best wishes. Thank you again. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Keeper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings 
and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.